and good hey, evening. Hey, good evening, and <laughs> welcome to Pub Theology. We are so glad that you are joining us tonight. Pub Theology is the program where we drink beer and talk about God. And we love hanging out here at none other than Copper State, the absolute best place to hang out in Green Bay, maybe with the exception of Mike's Pond or Taylor's Basement. I'm not sure. Those might rank a little bit higher than here. Probably not. If you want really great beer, come here. Although Taylor usually supplies a lot of it. And if not Taylor, actually Mike supplies it. I, I, I really do say. think your pond or your basement really I, are great second-class options. I appreciate the shout-out, but it, it's pub theology, not pond theology. <laughs> and not basement so, theology. I mean, we can totally I don't really know what basement there. theology the, is. The but Hobbit Hole. It's my little bar area. The Hobbit Hole. I, I, I like think it. that's what I'm officially going to call my, my, my bar. Is the I Hobbit like hole, that so. idea. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to go like too on the nose and call it um, like the Green Dragon or other things like that. So I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So. But it's still right. The Hobbit theme. hole is not to- is not on the nose, but the Green Dragon yeah. would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Though, can I just like <laughs> yes, side, I, sidebar? I, um, I need. I don't want to become a sword guy. I already have one Lord of the Rings sword that you saw. But you I, do, I, or you I, don't want to become a sword guy. I don't want to be a sword guy. So I only want to get another one more sword. And my wife said no to me today <laughs> about getting that second sword. It's only one hundred sixty dollars, and she said no. Can you believe it? Wow. Wow. Mark, talk, mark it in the books. Taylor's wife said no. Yeah. Yes. To, my, to a sword. Guys, <laughs> I got to just make an, a point for a second. Tonight, we have somebody in the pub with us who we often have in the pub, mm. but she's here in the pub for the last time ever. Aww. I'm going to just... Um, you can do a sad the, face. Switch, Go for it. Switch the camera for a second here because um, we got to show you on the pub cam here who we have... Oh, the pub cam. You can oh, see Zarya. Wait, Zarya, you have seen Zarya on before. She's been a part of this program <laughs> before. We really appreciated Zarya. Sadly, Zarya and her husband are moving out of the Green Bay area. Zarya, Luke, we, we love you guys, and we are going to miss you. And we wanted to just take a second to raise our glasses in honor of all that you guys have brought to the pub over the years. So to Zarya and Luke. Cheers. May God bless you on the trail that you guys go to. Cheers. Well, uh, that's that's emotional. Yeah. But also really glad that you're here. By the way, if you ever are in Green Bay on a Thursday night and you want to join us, first and third Thursday of the month, we stream live from the loft here at Copper State. And we would love to have you join us in the room. We really actually enjoy kind of having people in the room with us to interact with us. And then afterwards, we stick around and have a beer with you and have a chance to talk. But if you're joining us online, we're really glad that you joined us tonight. What we love is for you to chime in. Let us know you're here. Tell us that what you're drinking. Whoops. How did that happen? Sorry about that, everybody. I started the video too soon. (laughs) We love to have you chime in. Let us know what's going on in your life. Let us know what's going on in your home in your world, that's what we like to talk about tonight and address all of that from a theological perspective. So please, participate in the conversation. We will bring your thoughts, your questions, your comments into this conversation. We love doing that. Before we get started with stuff, we're going to just kind of go around the table here. Alex, Alex, this is, I mean, you also are going to be leaving us not too long. Mm -hmm. I think we'll still get to have you next time. Yes. But then that'll be the, well... I don't know if my heart can keep doing this, guys, having to say goodbye to such great friends. Not Mike, goodbye. you're not leaving me, are you? So I'm, I'm not weird. leaving you. But okay. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of emotion to, coming out here. Starting to feel it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just how it goes. But yeah. okay, so Alex, what are you drinking tonight? Some good old water. H2O. Oh no, that's Green Bay water. Iced that down vodka. Green Bay water. <laughs> water. Are you Green saying water. it's not good because it's Green Bay water? Oh no, it's water? good. Oh. It's Green Bay water. As long as it's not out of no. as long no. as it's Green not Bay from the, the Fox I, River. I think Green Bay water. <laughs> Green Bay water was voted like like the, one of the best. Yeah, really. I believe Seriously? so. Yeah. Really, I believe oh. so. Okay. Yeah. So is that is it does, is it because it's sourced from your pond or no? <laughs> that would explain why my pond water is getting low. Wow! Yeah, they're like they're like this is the water that we it need is. to have. 
<laughs> We're going to take this water. <laughs> no, no, it is definitely not from my pond. Okay, all right. Well, I'm having some of the St. Brigid's Stout. Nice. Which is one of the best stouts I've ever had, actually. Yeah. It's, it's mild, but it's it's flavorful. And I, I just, I don't know, I really like this. It one. was a great St. Patrick's Day stout. Yeah, it's yep. perfect for St. Patrick's Day. Yep. Although we're getting into the season when it's almost time for IPAs, right? Absolutely. Yeah, on a hot day, an yep. IPA is the perfect thing. It's not quite hot enough yet for us to really enjoy them. But we'll get there. It's coming, guys. It's coming. I'd like to re- respectfully disagree with your IPA assessment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, we're going to go with the beer mosa. I'm the drinking a beer mosa. Okay. Um, to, yeah. to, to put this in perspective to you guys, uh, if I had three of these... It would still be less alcohol content than one of those. <laughs> I mean, maybe not a St. Brigid Stout. No, no, not, not that. But whatever Mike's drink, which is? <clears throat> Lucky Sap. Oh, yeah. Lucky Sap. That's another stout, right? That's not a porter? Stout. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's the one that has, like, the flavors of, like, maple syrup and bourbon yep. and all that. It's quite delicious. Yeah, very good. Very good. So before we get launching into our topics for tonight, uh, this is, I, I promised Taylor something, that we would talk about birthdays in this episode, <laughs> yes. because this is the birthday episode. Oh, uh, today's the day. Now, it's the birthday episode because my birthday is next week, and this is the closest pub theology to my birthday. And I get to decide when the birthday episode happens because it, it, it's not an anniversary for pub theology or anything else. It's just my birthday. So <laughs> feel free to wish me a happy is, birthday. Is there a gift option that our watchers can do? Yeah, that would be awesome. Actually, okay. they could just go to stmarkministries.com, <laughs> use the give option. and <laughs> There you go. You won't be able to give it to me, but if you give it to St. Mark Ministries or any one of our projects in my name, I'll say thank you. Nice. So that's a way you could do that. But I told Taylor that he would get to share the worst story I've ever heard. <laughs> it's great. The on, worst? Well, I'm well, being a little, okay. I'm being a little well, there, hyperbolic. There but. Is a, yeah, there's a trend going on lately about, like, it was like, share with us your, like, most funny trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. So that's, I think, where this kind of comes yeah, from. Yeah, I remember bit. that's how you and introduced you, this to me originally. Uh, I love it. So share with us your funniest you trauma. Okay, I'll tell you this. So just be prepared. If anyone has um, like tissues, just keep it available. You, Alex, you haven't heard this story yet. No, no. you have not. I can't wait. For Michael, you have not heard this story yet. I've not. Okay, I've heard so this story. So I'm my, excited you to, for you guys to hear Who has the it. tissues here? <laughs> <laughs> so on my 18th birthday, I was really oh excited because you're, you're coming of age. You know, you normally do these like, you go and you'll, you'll buy a cigar. You can buy a lottery ticket. You can do all this stuff. So I was excited and I had to go to school that day. And it wasn't the greatest day. Let's be, it was my birthday, and I had to go to school. It was a rough day. But I came home, and I was looking forward to it. I got home. I walked into the house, and all the lights were off, and there was nobody home. And there was a cake on the table, and I went over to the cake, and I saw a letter. I was like, oh, oh, good. And the letter was from my parents, and it said, we had to go out if you want... If you want to eat your cake, go ahead. Just take a picture with it before you do. <laughs> That's not the sad part. That is so sad, though. What I, what's even better is that I took that cake into the living room. I did not take a picture with it, but I did, alone, in the dark, sing myself happy birthday. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so alone. I, and a single tear fell into the cake. <laughs> and that is, that was my 18th birthday. That is so sad. It actually kind of is. <laughs> it's 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 really it's the first time I heard this I I was I, I was like it just kept getting worse. Like <laughs> like to be a, to be helping home and you're like there's nobody here. And there was no surprise. It was just there's nobody here. And then there's a cake, but there's a letter saying go ahead and eat it. <laughs> just take a picture. Here I thought don't expect us to show up. <laughs> I thought you were buying the lottery ticket and the cigar and then going to school. <laughs> and then on top of that, to sing yourself happy birthday. Oh, Taylor, my, yeah. my heart hurts, and at the same time, I understand mm. you so much better now. <laughs> you can, yeah, help everybody understands me. Do you have your guitar? Maybe we could just sing him. <laughs> I don't have a guitar with okay. me. But, I mean, we could start singing happy birthday, but it's not even close to his birthday. No, it's not. No, not even so close. it wouldn't make any sense. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you could sing. You could sing "Happy Birthday" to me right now, to, Mike. To if you. you want to, yes. if you want to. Happy okay. birthday, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna sing it. Though. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Hey, that was pretty good. Yeah, I like thanks. It. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. T- uh, you know what, Taylor? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. Tonight we got a lot of things to talk about, right? Yeah, we do. Way too many things to talk about. <laughs> a little bit. I was yeah. going through the list. I was like, man, this is a lot. We don't have to go through all of it. We might Some talk about robots. We might talk about angels and demons. A little bit. We might talk about false gods. We might talk about leadership in the church. We might talk about uh, what happens if the what would have happened if the Cold War went wrong. Ooh. All um, kinds of stuff. These are a lot of topics. Yeah, this is a lot, guys. Is this the extended uh, segment of yeah. of pub theology where we, that we, we go till ten o'clock? Yeah, I mean, we'll start up Patreon. I don't think we would be able to convince our watchers <laughs> to our viewers no. to stick with us for that. Long. I think Copper State would be closed too. That's right. They usually turn off the lights on us before yep. we finish anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Man. I don't blame them. Uh, really, I don't either. They're like, they're doing their <laughs> podcast thing, but we're done. But, but you so, were Taylor, what are we going to start with tonight? Well, why don't we talk about this? Why don't we talk about what's in the news here? I love it. Let's I do it. it. Taylor's amazing bumper. Yeah, so I was. Uh, Thanks, man. I uh, I'm really excited about. So okay, I want to tell you guys what's in the news that I saw. <laughs> what's up? I am going to share this because this this was wild okay, to me. Okay. So you know, and if you've been watching this for any amount of time, you know that I'm really fascinated by robots, artificial intelligence, advancing technology, and transhumanism. And I saw this video today of Boston Dynamics. They are. The company that came out with, if you remember seeing like a robot dog from a few years ago called Spot that was able to like get around pretty easily. And they've been working on this humanoid robot. And I've seen some videos of the humanoid robot like picking up a box and walking with it and setting it down. And it's kind of clunky and it looks kind of very like robocop like he can barely do it. I got to show you guys this though. This is wild. Watch this. There's no sound for this video, but I mean, I mean, watch this thing. Stand up. Like, it didn't even, that wasn't even human looking, right? And then it turns and it can spin its body and it comes walking right after you. And now it's going to turn around and it's going to go back the other way. And it's just, that's freaky, right? It's It's a little uncanny valley. A very uncanny valley. But here's the deal, guys. Like, the whole reason they're doing this is because they're, they're hoping that these humanoid robots will be able to accomplish tasks that otherwise would risk human life. Like, for example, um, in battle, you could send a humanoid robot into battle, and it can do things that you know that a human otherwise would have to be sent. Go in and defuse a bomb somewhere. I feel like there was a movie about infiltrate. this already. <laughs> Probably. I mean, yeah. But they also think that they could be used for things like construction or other manual labor that's maybe a little bit more difficult, mining operations, stuff like that. There are even people who think, well, eventually we could bring the cost of these things down to where somebody who maybe is shut in, right? Somebody whose health means they can't go out in public could, set, could have a robot that they could send to the store and pick up groceries for them and bring them back. All that sounds really awesome. I mean, it sounds like ways to make human life better in some ways, right? To eliminate suffering, eliminate harm, eliminate death. But here's the big question, right? What happens when you detach the idea about what humans are made for, what makes us human, what God has designed us to be, and instead you start creating robots that are just... Ha- there's Sky is the limit with how they interact with the world what next right what do they start replacing for us i would just like one to come and clean my house fair <laughs> so that's i'm gonna wait till that robot is you, you know at a, a discount i don't have a room but i should probably <laughs> i should probably start with that i mean that um, would be a place to start yeah, if you really want a robot to that's clean true. house. but i mean the, the, with his moves he could clean behind the toilet scrub a shower 
and probably do laundry all at the same time. And he won't complain. And he wouldn't complain. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, Mike, here's what I want you to think about. Isn't it true that having your kids do that work is really urging them towards holiness? Right. Like having your son clean behind the toilet okay. is an exercise in sanctification. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 see, I see where you're going. And um, so if you had actually, a robot to do it for you, sure. then your son would miss out on the opportunity to do the things that God has designed him to do. Which is why I brought that up, because it goes exactly with what your question is. Yeah. It, it, sounds, like, it sounds like fun. It sounds like it's really cool. It sounds like, hey, this takes care of taking care of a person who's shut in. But ultimately, yeah, the, w w then we are missing out on, on serving other people and, and we're replacing it with a robot. Yeah, yeah. And so with sure. any kind of function, whether it's cleaning, visiting, grabbing groceries, it sounds like a great concept. Yeah, but what's the, what's the downside? Yeah. And, and reducing human suffering. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that I think about is, okay, so let's say we're able to use these things for war. That sounds great at first, right? We, we eliminate the loss of human life involved in warfare. But then what cost have we eliminated too, right? Like if, if warfare doesn't cost us human life, just lots of money, then we just keep throwing robots at each other until... Actually, that's really scary. Yeah. Right. And at what point does one nation say, we don't care about the loss of human life. We just care about the loss of our lives. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep throwing robots at you until you're all dead, mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there's there's some pretty frightening things there. Plus, there's got to be something about... I mean, I'm not saying that it's good for a soldier to go into war and have to take the life of another, right? But there's something about the fact that there's a human element that forces a person to stop and go, I have to make decisions here. Whereas robot warfare sounds to me a little bit like just throwing everything at each other until one side gives up. And that's... There's something unhealthy there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hmm. Where did that even come from? Well, I found the video, and I okay. was kind of curious about okay. this because, you know, this is one of the things that um, I've, I've spent a lot of time researching and writing about this over the last few years. I mean, you guys maybe remember that I wrote a, a, a master's thesis on this topic a few years ago. I actually wrote a paper earlier than that about artificial intelligence. And I have a, a, an interesting... Uh, you guys can tell me what you think about this. Um, let me ask this question. What... What is our responsibility as human beings to the robots, the AIs, the artificial beings that we create? What is that? What is our responsibility mm. to them? I think, Are they just wait, things that we can just destroy? Them? Well, if we've created them, mm -hmm. well, we've, we've put them together and formed yeah. them. And it, you're right, and I think that because we created it, there's a certain level of respect that we must sh we must show it as sure. well. Not that it can feel it, but like you need to be able to respect the device that you are using. And why is that? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a that's a that's a great question. Kind of go off off track of what I was going what I was about to say, <laughs> but but no, that's a good that's a good question that I haven't given a ton of thought yet. Well, let's, but it's let's kind of like, what Alex thinks because she's been really quiet about this. Maybe this is a hot take. But robots freak me out, so I would have no issue with us destroying things if it gets bad enough. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you this, Alex. I'm going to give you a scenario. Okay. I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine that this is 20 years in the future, and robots have now become a normal thing in our society. And you're walking down the street, and you see a group of four teenage boys, and they've got something on the side of the road. And they are just beating the crap out of it. Like, they are just destroying this thing, right? And at first you're thinking, what are those guys doing? Like, they're just being teenage boys, right? Because being teenage boys like to break stuff. But as you get closer, you see that it looks like a person. And at first you're afraid that they're hurting somebody. So you rush in and say, okay, hey, stop, stop, what are you doing? And then you realize, no, it's not a person. It's somebody's servant robot. It's some shut-ins service bot. And they're destroying it. And they just look at you and they go, it's just a thing. It's not a person. It's just a robot. What's the big deal? What do you say to them? You pose a good question. Um, 
I don't know what I would do in that scenario. I think, like you were saying, technological advancements and robots and all of that are going to serve us in some ways. They're, they're being created with a good intention, with this is how we can have medical advancements and this is how we can help people who are disabled and people who can't get out of their homes. I just, my mind goes to the, the flip side of this stuff gets out of hand so quickly. Like yeah, we create these yeah. things and then we can't control them anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, like even my phone freaks me out sometimes. I'm like, it's listening to me and I don't <laughs> like that. So I just imagining like people sized robots walking around like that freaks me out. Or like the, I think we talked about maybe a month ago, like the chips that they're oh, put, yeah. putting in people's brains. Like again, really great technological science like medical advancement but like there's always just that thing for me of okay how is this gonna go wrong like where is this gonna start becoming a negative thing instead of a helpful thing yeah right. so rather than going to the future brandon you brought you gave me a flashback okay i'm gonna go back to the to the 80s okay with with not necessarily a robot but it was a talking car named kit Oh, yeah. Knight Rider. So David Hasselhoff had Knight Rider. He, was, he had the car Kit. And so the episode where Kit is drowned in acid was like my brother and I as little kids. And we were like so into this talking, bulletproof, turbo boosting car dies in acid from the evil, from the evil guy. Oh, that's emotional right there. It was. Yeah. As a kid, that was emotional. Like, kid is dead. So, Taylor, I'm curious what you think about that scenario. Well, um, <clears throat> By the way, we shouldn't overlook this. Michael, are you okay? I'm okay. Thinking about... I have the, I have the DVDs. I, I, go, I know how... I go back and I can okay. watch how it ends. Looking right. back, now yeah. I understand... You. I now I understand you more. <laughs> <laughs> because of that episode. A pivotal um, moment. That was your trauma? <laughs> yes. Childhood trauma? Childhood trauma. Okay. Um, no, no. So, <clears throat> I've just been racking my brain about your last question, by the way, about why. You know, why do we... Why should we respect it? And I think it's because we... Well, it's bringing me back to not maybe the 80s, but the 90s. And uh, that line Jeff Goldblum gave in, uh, in Jurassic Park when he said, it didn't take any discipline for you to attain it. And it's the way, that's the way that I'm kind of seeing it, is that we, yeah. were, we, as, we as humans are supposed to try to model, that, model this, the way that Christ and God loves us and loves his creation. God created us. Never once did he then start treating us like trash and like we were nothing. Um, and that's kind of the same way I feel like if we were to create something like like that, it would it, you would see you would see these four teenagers like pummeling this this basically defenseless robot. Um, objectively, there's probably nothing wrong with that. Legally, there's probably some issues with you know property damage, yeah. but morally speaking, that was a, something that was created. Took a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline to create, and for you to treat it like it was. You know, nothing like it was second class, like it was, I don't know, a bug or something like that, which yeah. even bugs are often should be treated with a certain level of respect, sure. but I don't think anybody throws a fit when you step on an ant. Um, right. But we didn't, we weren't the ones that created that either. So when we create something as, as advanced as, I don't know, like this, this uh, Boston's Di Boston Dynamics, I don't know. I, so here's my, here's my hmm. idea on this. And like I said, I've written about this and I, when I thought, a lo thought long and hard about this question, I landed on the question of what does it mean to treat something humanely? Like, let's say, replace the robot with a dog for a second. We would all look at the, these boys killing a, a dog, just beating it senseless. We would all go, that's horrible. What's wrong with you, right? We look at these boys and we go, what the heck is wrong with you that you would treat a dog this way? And now replace that dog, once again, with a human-looking robot. And wouldn't we say the same thing? What is wrong with you? That you would see a human-looking robot and you would just be inspired to just destroy. What's going on in your hearts? The origin of the idea of humane treatment of animals is actually not that we treat humans or that we treat animals as though they are human. It's that we treat animals based on our humanity. Mm -hmm. 
that is we lose something of our humanness when we treat animals badly there's something about us that gets broken when we just senselessly destroy another being and so i what i thought about was is there a a sense in which humane treatment of robots will matter to us i think i think so and i think it's a it's an ethic we're going to have to wrestle with as human beings in the next 20 years because we're seeing already like this video proves this is coming right so we have to start wrestling with the ethic of as human beings what is my humane my human treatment of the the things we create yeah. you know and even this i mean i would say even the same is true if if i saw a bunch of guys wailing on somebody's car parked on the curb i'd be like is that your car no why are you doing, are that? You doing that well something's wrong with you right why would why senseless destruction right. Before, it's the same idea yeah, or exactly. lowering it into acid right that's intense it's that's pretty evil right yeah it was just a thing but it S- mattered spoiler alert did Never mind. I'll back? let you. I'll let you watch it. Did Kit come back? He, Kit comes back. Yes. <gasps> you spoiled he's, it. Now he's I'm new never, and improved. Well, now I don't want to watch <laughs> like, it. Like better than ever. <laughs> I just don't like. I don't know. I just. Before, I think it's old enough that it's okay. <laughs> it <is>. <laughs> before <laughs> making all of this available publicly, I always feel like you should never underestimate the corrupt nature of our hearts. Really, it's just yep. don't underestimate it. I know yeah. people might be like, oh, people won't be like that. No, they will be, and they'll be a lot worse. So stop yeah. stop sugarcoating it. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. All right, well, that's all I have to say about <laughs> so, it, too, but I think it's something we have to wrestle with. Yeah. I, I'm, you know me, I like to throw in news items that yeah. don't really pertain to anything that just, just make do. us you know, happy. <laughs> uh, but apparently in Australia, there was a racehorse, and he escaped... And he en- he ended up um, he ended up at the uh, the where was it it was the train station yeah he ended up at the train station mm-hmm. and he stood behind the yellow line <laughs> like, <laughs> good horse so, good yes, boy <laughs> at the station stood behind the yellow line so I love I will, it. Uh, I what will, a fantastic I horse <laughs> he was I mean he was waiting and and so it was it was kind of funny because it says. Uh, he, he appeared to pursue an informant along the platform before unsuccessfully attempting to board a train service. He was like, he yeah. I am guess. done with this race yeah. business. But here's the best part. Hopping on a train. <laughs> here's how they concluded it. No one involved in the inc- incident is intending to take any further action as the individual was only horsing around. <laughs> I quit. Wow. I feel like that's a... <laughs> I don't know if my son Paladin is watching, but that He'd that's a Paladin joke <laughs> if I ever heard one, man. <laughs> wow, yeah. All right, so there's the link for you if you need it. It's a escape race. Wow. Before we it. move past the robot thing, I feel like now tonight I'm just going to be thinking about, like, Ultron and the, um, <laughs> what are the cars that turn into... Transformers? Transformers. And that, wow, that, weird, little creepy, that weird little creepy youth. robot that, I don't remember what he's called, but... The That's what I think of, Toy like, Story. when Ooh, I think, no. like, Ooh. <laughs> creepy little robot. It's a creepy little yeah. car thing in whatever you just said. I watched like two of them when I was younger. I think it was, I know, I know, I think I know. Right, the one it's from like this little spidery robot that's a bad guy in yes. Transformers. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know what his name is, but he's this little creepy thing. That's what I think of when I think okay. like robots turning against us. Like, ooh. I think of Terminator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I of think Terminator of, yeah. too. <laughs> or I Robot. How do we get the three laws in place now? Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> well, you, anybody else have any other news items to bring up? Well, I got one great story for you. Okay. Great documentary, in fact. I got a little bit of a, uh, uh, a trailer here that Lauren's going to uh, play for us. Let's take a look at it. See that? Just a little bit of one. How long is this? Hmm. One. Man. She has a divine plan to help humanity. <laughs> 19 billion years old, reincarnated Jesus. She was Joan of Arc, Cleopatra. She's God. This is Mother God and the Earth Allies. 
Wow. Okay. That is so a, that is a show. So that was a show. Uh, it's a documentary on on HBO Max. If you guys are ever interested in that, it's called Love Is One: The Cult of Mother God. It's only three episodes long, and it is it's some it's a worth a watch. First of all, it's it's short enough where it's not like you don't have to dedicate eight hours of your time. Honestly, it's like three hours of your of your time if you really want to sit down and binge it. But like it is, it's. What weird. do you think my time is worth, Taylor? <laughs> Three what's hours. minimum? What's minimum wage <laughs> these days? Um. You're gonna pay me fifty bucks for that? Because actually, my time—I don't I actually know if I get that much. But. So, <laughs> tell us why it's worth the watch. Sorry. I, well, Kurt, I like how this, by the way, just to uh, get off track quick. Kurt says uh, Mike could take over as the next Terminator. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate that. <laughs> you say I'll be back. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, no. I totally ruined it. <laughs> but this show, um, so this show, Cult of Mother God, it's it really is. It's just a, a quick documentary about this woman who who uh, eventually decides that she is God. That uh, this, these these clouds in the sky are actually these spaceships by this like galactic team um, who's led by none other than Robin Williams. Um, that makes sense, right? But Naturally. she has this, yeah, she has this idea in her head that she's like spreading love and awareness and peace and that God is not actually a man, that there is a male part of God, but there's also the female part of God and that she is God, she is mother God incarnate and that she has this like counterpart, the father God and they're to, you know, there's this tension between them and that she's going to be taking all of the pain and suffering of the world with her as she ascends into this spaceship with her galactic team. Once again, led by Robin Williams. Wait, so where is Robin? He's in the documentary, or he's, no, he's dead. He's, I know that. <laughs> but he's, the, he's like he's like um, he is one of the representatives of this mother god that was sent to Earth in real life when yeah. she was really there, or the documentary. So she believed. She believes that, that Robin Williams is oh, actually from space. She it. watched way too much Mork and Mindy as a kid. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and there. Well, he's in the fifth dimension with like Joan of Arc, and and one well, Jesus was a was a. In fact, he was also a a, a representative of of Mother God, and it's just, it's bizarre. So she drank. Basically, she. It was honestly. I think it was really just kind of an excuse. She had a lot of trauma in her life um, prior to, and I think she kind of just up and left life at some point, and was deciding decided to be. A, you know, I was gonna. I'm gonna drink. I'm gonna party. I'm gonna smoke. I'm gonna do all these drugs, and I'm gonna kind of create this this story that I am God. And it, she started to get a few followers, and it eventually eventually she had, had passed away. I don't want to give too much uh, detail away, but it's it is kind of a sad scenario. But it gets you thinking about like cults and cult leaders, and in, in general, like are they just off their rocker? Did they just? I were they like an L. Ron Hubbard type person and just kind of wrote a sci-fi story? <laughs> And 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 kind of went went from there, or or do, do you know the story of L. Ron Hubbard? Oh yes, Hannah and I sat and watched a documentary on Scientology. Oh, okay. In fact, and it is wild. Well, I that mean, story. I mean, it was a dare, like, right? Or essentially, life. a bet yeah. between two sci-fi authors who could mm-hmm. who could successfully create a cult, mm-hmm. and start a religion. Did you know that? Ooh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Roger Zelazny was another sci-fi author. He and L. Ron Hubbard were kind of they knew each other. And they basically had a bet to see which one of them could write a sci-fi story that would spark a new religion. Mm-hmm. And uh, Roger Zelazny wrote a book called Stranger in a Strange Land, which um, the main character was named Michael. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Not Robin and then, Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then L. Ron Hubbard wrote um, Battlefield Earth. Which Battlefield is, Earth. Yeah, that was the that was the the book that launched it. And then he then he wrote the book Dianetics, which was mm-hmm. kind of a more like a yeah, manifesto like, kind of like laying out the uh, the principles of Scientology. But mm-hmm. Battlefield Earth was the sci fi novel that yeah. really started it. Dianetics started to fail a little bit, so he kind of kind of came up with like a new like updated version of it. I can't remember what it's called though. It's like um. Well, the Dianetics was like the first one, and then there yeah. were a number of other books past that one yeah. as well. The Battlefield Earth was the sci-fi novel that started it. Right. You just so, got to reach clear. I think is what the, the it, is it was just fascinating level, but, that these two authors basically said, maybe. which of us could come up with a, a new religion by writing a, a book that would get people to buy into mm-hmm. it? But, um, and now they've got Tom Cruise on their side. Yeah. Oh, don't even, yeah, don't even get me started. That poor guy. I don't know if he's being used. Jump on a couch and talk about.
Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that like you kind of get the sense that like John Travolta and Tom Cruise, they have so much information on it because like through that, they're like weird counseling thing. They have to like basically tell all the most dirty secrets possible, and then they get to keep all of that, of course, and then they can kind of use it against them as like if you turn away from Scientology or turn against Scientology, all of this will come out. So you think they, that they're not really actually like? Oh into no, it I or? think they. I think they are. It's just I think that. Even if they wanted to turn away, you can't like, at this point. Okay. And that They're I feel like is a, is, a cult, is a cultish thing as well. Because okay. um, it tends to be, even even in um, this show that I was watching, towards the end of her life, she starts, mortality actually hits her. She understands that she's going to die soon. And she starts to question, I, none of this is real. I don't think any of this is real. I want to see my daughters, like I, or my daughter and my son. Like, Whoa. Wow, and there, and but the people around her then are just saying, "No, that's not real. That's just the pain talking. You are God, you, and like you can't, oh, wow. she can't even leave at this point, even if she wanted to." Um, so, uh, you know, Taylor, here's what I'm thinking about with this story. What's the appeal? Yeah. Like, why does a person say, "All right, here we have the ability to read a book called the Bible." It's gonna, that, that really, I mean, in, in so many ways, it holds every answer you could, you know, to any question you could ask. I mean, yeah, not always in a way that's word for word, the question I asked, here's the exact answer. But, like, it shows me what life is really about. It tells me who the true God is, what he's done, what the world is about, what my life is about, where it's all going. Like, I have all of this. So why would I listen to some person who shows up and goes, oh, no, I'm God. Like some person who just randomly starts a cult and they they gain a following. Why? Right. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's like, it's almost as though like they're, <sighs> so it kind of feeds back into, I feel like it feeds back into Gnosticism a little bit at like some of the, the foundational beliefs of Gnosticism of that hidden knowledge. Like there's the, there's the mainstream understanding of scripture uh, there, there, are, you know, worldwide churches that are, are dedicated to it, that are giving this information to people, so so they can know and have a personal relationship with the Christ. And that's almost too boring for them. Like I know everybody knows that, but this person here seems to be offering me something that nobody else knows, and therefore it, it must be true. I don't know if that's the thought process there. And yeah. I know I know they've done some they've done a bunch of research on like the type of people that join cults, especially I think they did a lot of research into the the um, like Heaven's Gate cult too, and that cult in particular they looked at these people and they're like there's nothing out of the ordinary. It's not like they every one of them had been you know like every single one of them had been beaten as a child. Like there's there's no real common denominator there. It just it tends to have something to do with some trauma, some sort of a trauma. It tends to be at just the right moment, you know, like. They just happen to lose a job, they, and they happen to take this, you know, sojourn to try to figure themselves out. They just happen to ask, ask. Even if they were religious, they sometimes will ask, "God, please give me a sign." And then all of a sudden, this flyer shows up in their hand about some cult. And they're like, "Well, thanks, God, that's the sign." Like, uh, I, but I don't know. I don't have a good answer to to why. Well, Mike, I mean, I know you. You joined a cult, Mike, so you understand. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but Mike, you know, as somebody who you read hearts, you know, you 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 look at a person and in their mess, you look through and you go, "I see the heart that's hurting behind it." Is there anything that makes you go, "I think I see where this is coming from"? People are there's there's a probably a group of people who are, are drawn to, here is somebody who cares about me and can possibly heal my hurt and my trauma or my past, and I'm going to take a chance on it. Hmm. Boy, that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I mean, it's still, they're still wrong. Absolutely. And cults, one after another, have sort of proven that this, <laughs> this doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But I think you're you're onto something. There. Here's someone who is giving me attention, who can can maybe, if there's a chance, maybe they can heal my past. Yeah. In some odd, weird way, right. I'm gonna go with it. Yeah. 
I got. I have to ask this question to you guys, so you, since you guys are in the the ministry field actively every day. Like this is your profession. How would you, how would you evangelize to somebody that is in a cult? So somebody that truly believes, like this cult, they they truly believe that the, this woman who died was God, like is God still. How do you like say, okay, so the God you believe in is not real. My God is real. First of all, I'm curious as to where I'm meeting up with this person if they are in a cult. <laughs> at the cult meeting. <laughs> they're at the cult meeting. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm just going into a quick trip to I grab mean, a cup of coffee. I'm not going to run into them. Well, so. I mean, cultists got to get coffee and gas too, Mike. <laughs> no, I think they make their own. <laughs> oh, okay. You might be right about that. <laughs> uh, well said. Well played. Yeah, okay. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I mean, but maybe you're getting coffee and gas at a sure. gas station that's in the middle of Nowheresville, Wisconsin. Like, you, like there's no, like it's one of those small towns near where the cult hideout is sure. or whatever they call it. And they have shown up to sell their fruit. Sure. You, you, you probably don't go with what, I'm not pointing sure, what you no, set no, out. Right. You, you're wrong. What are you doing? Yeah. It's almost more of, are you okay? Yeah. What are you doing? Is yeah. everything all right? That's good. That's good. Just start, just start by asking them questions. Yeah. That's what I was thinking when you were talking, Taylor. Is I, don't, I don't think I start with the God that you worship is wrong, but let me tell you how my God is right. Because then right. we get into a my God's bigger than your God kind of debate, yeah. which doesn't really work, mm -hmm. right? It's the, the childhood playground argument. But what I can do is I can say to these, you know, I mean, let's say I have somebody who, because that, that's kind of an odd question, like, when do I have the chance to actually have a real conversation? Well, let's imagine I do. I think my first question is, why do you believe this person is God? What have they done to prove it to you? Well, if God really was on earth, taking the form of, a, of this person, what would you expect them to do? Well, has this person done that? Well, well here's what I would expect them to do. I would expect them to be able to heal all the hurts. Have they healed everything that you've been hurting from? Yeah. I would expect them to be glorious. Is she glorious? I would expect her to be able to prove through miraculous signs and wonders that she really is. Has she done that? Yeah. Now, I, that's a little bit dicey even as I'm just thinking out loud that maybe if Satan is working through the situation, possibly, yeah. And that's kind of my question is that these cult leaders, are they, is it just a story that they're coming up with or is there something demonic behind it? I mean, it could be, I mean, it could be either one. Right. And I know, I know anything that's kind of, anything that really goes against, you know, Christ or puts someone putting themselves in the place of God, there's always something demonic kind of behind that. Right. But or like these people, like these visions, these, these yeah. visions of Robin Williams, mm -hmm. um, are you... Are they being fed something, yeah. dem, you know, demonically? Basically, is what I mean. Are the visions demonic? That's that's kind of what I, the question I'm asking. So. I think we should ask our expert evangelist over here, Alex. You? That's you. That's you, Alex. Expert. You Pastor mean, Fail. You mean Lauren over <laughs> here? She's the that's expert you. evangelist. <laughs> oh, she is a fantastic evangelist. She is, she is. Yes. absolutely. Um, She's constantly sharing her faith with the people she works yeah. with that she knows. Yeah, Lauren. We love our producer. We if do. you haven't we recognized do. this before, we. We mention her once in a while. She's she's shy. She doesn't like to be on camera. She should have a camera on her. She but should. she's fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Lauren, for everything yeah. you do for us. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's not her birthday. It's not her birthday, Taylor. But back to Alex. Alex, your thoughts on how to how to reach out to a cultist? I mean, I initially was like, I don't think I would change anything. Like I would do what I would do with someone of any other religion. Like when you're when you're talking to somebody that doesn't believe the things you believe, like you want to create a relationship so that they feel comfortable speak like maybe not a relationship with a person in a cult. That might that might ugh, I don't know. But you want to <laughs> depends on the kind of relationship <laughs> right. you're talking about yeah. building. Like like befriending people and cuz you're never going to get anywhere if you're immediately like you're in a cult. You're wrong. Like you need to be convert. Like they're immediately going to be like, "Oh, you just don't agree with what we believe." Like it's it takes time and it takes showing that you're actually invested in their life and that you care about them and you're not just trying to push your religion on them. I think that's how we go about talking to 
anyone of any other religion. Yeah. yeah. If if anyone would is any if anyone is actually going to watch this too, I would just like at home. I would honestly please just just go into it. I know how easy it is. I know how Hollywood works to try to get you to just you know discount them and just be like those idiots those stupid people how could they believe that i'm gonna sit here and watch and you know feel good about myself because i'm not that crazy don't don't go into it go into it understanding that these people are lost they need they need that savior they need to know that savior and really i mean your heart should really go out to these people i think that if we look at our own stories every single one of us who trusts in jesus does so because we recognize that we have a need We have a deep need that we cannot ourselves meet. And we trust in Jesus because Jesus promises to meet that need. And he backs that promise up with the most incredible event in human history that a man would say, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And then he pulls it off. Mm -hmm. That somebody would actually come back to life after dying. Not, Not as a fake out, not as a trick, but actually happens. Like, that should make us go, there's something there, right? But we trust in that not because, not just because, well, gee, history attests to it, but because there is something we recognize a need that we all have and that Jesus meets that need and we've experienced Jesus meeting that need. Um, So for the cultists, recognize there is just as deep of a need and they're just trying to meet it with something that makes sense to them. And we have the message. And you know, that's where I was thought you were going to go, Alex, when you said, um, do the same thing we would do with everybody. My answer to that is, let's do the same thing we would always do, which is try to get the conversation to Jesus, right? And maybe that's the thing that I ask the cultists. I say, well, okay, so you think this person is God, but what about Jesus? I mean, Jesus claimed to be God too. So is this person also Jesus or not? Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about whether or not we can compare those claims. So... Actually, so Susan has a great question. I don't have. I don't think we can really get into it too much right now. I think we need to get into oh, scripture here soon. Yeah, but like, we really do need to get to scripture. But, but like, thank you, Sue. This for is a great this question. question. This is fantastic. And I'd like to lead quickly. I think Brandon, you and I actually have a plan to sit down at some point and actually discuss this exact question. Believe it or not, we do. Yeah, we have we a plan to, to have a whole conversation about what do we say to Mormons and JWs. Can we give a cliff notes? I mean, answer? cliff notes is this. I have had Christians tell me with a little bit of pride, and I don't, I'm not calling anybody out by name, but it's ha- definitely happened where I've had people say, well, they came to my door and I told them, this is a Christian house, you better get out of here. Mm-hmm. And they kind of feel like they're proud of themselves for that. My answer to that usually is, well, gee, they came to your door looking to talk about Jesus. Wouldn't that have been a great opportunity to share your faith? When someone comes and knocks on your door and says, would you like to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? As a Christian, your first answer should be, absolutely. Right. Let's do it. Now, if they're a Jehovah's Witness or they're Mormon or any other kind of cultist, whatever, you know you're getting into a conversation with somebody who doesn't speak the same language as you. They may use the same words, but they don't speak the same language. This is really important to understand that when a Mormon talks about Jesus or God or Trinity or salvation or any of those things, they have completely different definitions for those words. So you need to do a lot of listening. You need to do a lot of asking questions. But ultimately, you need to do a lot of pointing to Jesus. And here's the really important thing. Don't get stuck in minutia. So often people get arguing about things like whether or not you're supposed to give a tithe or whether or not you know, the temple in Seattle is, is holy, you know, or whether or not um, Jesus was tied to a stake or, or actually hung on a cross. Don't get stuck on that. Talk about what Jesus did. Focus on that. It's, it matters. Well said. Well said. We need to get to Scripture. Guys, we got to talk about Scripture tonight if we're going to do our, what we're going to do. So let's go. Okay, Michael, read it for us, please. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written 
in heaven. And, I, and I, I missed a part here. This is after the 72 returned, and they returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Wow. So, as always, we're approaching a statement of Jesus that maybe kind of catches us and sort of puts us in our place uh, because we live in a world that likes to say, I don't necessarily want to be a Christian, but I like Jesus. I actually just saw a stat on this recently that um, in the U.S., it was something like more than 50%. It was over, it was like 59% or something like that of U.S. teenagers say they believe Jesus is somebody who, is, who cares for you who shares love and is and is worth listening to. So more than half of people in America think Jesus is worth listening to. At least young people in America think Jesus is worth listening to. But they don't necessarily call themselves Christian. So here's the thing. If Jesus is worth listening to, we got to listen to everything he said, including weird passages like this. So let's talk about this. Like like you said, Mike, the, the 72 come. They're all excited. The demons, we were casting out demons, man. Yeah. And Jesus is like, first response, yeah, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Right. What? Okay, Alex, you're a resident theologian now. <laughs> because you have the studied, studied this in school formally most recently, right? Yes. So tell us, what is Jesus talking about? Oh, boy. You know, that's a great question. <laughs> Like, can I phone a, a great, friend? What a great way to start so. to just buy yourself some time by saying, that's a good question. <laughs> that, yeah. Exactly buy, buy what I'm doing. Three seconds. And then every student, Alex, what you do <laughs> is you pass the question on to somebody else in the conversation. Well, Lori, 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 su- <laughs> Lori suggests, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if Lori is telling us what she's drinking or if she's suggesting what you should have, but she says Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Lori. Oh, so in order to find the answer, <laughs> Alex, Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, no, go ahead, Alex. That, I mean, don't quote me on this because I don't know for sure, but when I see passage 18 of, of seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven, I just think about we don't know exactly what happened after creation, yeah. but we know that at some point after the angels were created – there was an uprising of sorts and some of them wanted the authority of God or turned away from the authority of God and were rejected from heaven. So, Oh, oh, one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. The fact that he says, I saw that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That just reinforces that we know that Jesus was one there at creation. There you go. Jesus is relating to something that he was there. He was a witness of this. That's really cool. That's really important. Yeah. You know, when people claim, you know, when people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, I think mm. you're not reading Jesus very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's sure saying, I, I saw this happen. Now, here's an interesting thing. There's there's kind of a theory, and this is, I've, I've read some stuff about this, and I'm fascinated by it, that there's references in the Old Testament that God apportioned sort of authority over different geographic locations of the earth to different heavenly beings that he created. Some of those heavenly beings rebelled. And that that, that might explain why you see in the Old Testament these demon worships or these false god worships where people say, well, our country worships this god and our country worships this god. Well, maybe that was not just that they just invented their own ideas, but that actually there were these demons who had been, these, these, these angelic beings that had been created, given authority over an area, had turned away from God, and yet still had authority over that area. Mm-hmm. And they were, you know, deceiving the people there into believing and trusting in them and worshiping them instead of the true God. And there's a couple of hints that Satan, perhaps, had been the one, the angelic being, who was not given one specific geography, but was given the sort of the authority to oversee all of them. And then maybe his rebellion came when he said, if I've get, been given authority to oversee the whole earth, well, why shouldn't all these people just worship me instead of God? After all, this whole place is mine. And the biggest hint there is that Satan says to Jesus in his temptation, I've been given this whole earth and I can give it to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Sounds an awful lot like he's saying, hey, look, that's originally what I wanted in the first place. And Jesus is responding saying, I, I'm not going to do that. 
Well, we were right. just re- we were just reading about this in our small group too in Ezekiel when he when he's talking about about Satan in particular. Yeah. You know, after after he kind of shifts discussion from the king of Tyre to to yeah. Satan himself, and there's all these references of you were adorned, you were more majestic than anything else, you were more beautiful than everything else, and you were you know you were crowned with uh, all these, and it was all these jewels from earth. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know what? I'm starting to lean into that theory a little bit more all of a sudden. Yeah. Now, Sue actually brings up an interesting point that perhaps, and I have read this interpretation, that Jesus was saying that, well, what he saw was that some of Satan's power was diminished or taken away from because of these things that this, the, 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 that he's sort of saying to them, you know, as you guys went out there and you were casting out demons, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven, man. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I was just seeing him just drop with all the work you guys are doing. And that... You know, that would be an interesting interpretation. I don't have a problem with that interpretation. Um, it's not how classic theologians, historical theologians understood it. That is a newer interpretation. And I guess all I'll say is that my inclination is to trust older theologians rather than newer theologians when it comes to interpreting difficult passages. And the reason I, I, I lean towards that usually, I'll say usually, is because they're closer in time to the culture and the language. Mm. And so they're more likely to, be, to get it right mm. because they're linguistically and culturally closer. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, that's, that they always get it right. There are a lot of times that I read something from an older theologian, I go, whoa, that's weird. And I come back and go, no, I think we're, we're yeah. better off where we are. But that's just my only caution with that. It could be. It could be. Yeah. Sue's, this, the interpretation Sue is offering could be the case. Yeah. If I may, too, I'd like to, I'd like to just throw my, my, my hand in the, the ring here a little bit, or my hat in the ring. Uh, but as I'm reading this, even, even in just English, I'm kind of looking at it. And what I'm kind of getting the sense is that he was, they were saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in, in your name. And he jumps on it and says, look, guys, I saw, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Yeah. I have given you this authority. Now stop rejoicing that they submit to you. You have nothing to do with it. Like, you're not the oh. ones. Like, you're not the ones that they're submitting to. It's not in your name that, it, that they're submitting. It's, it's in my name. But I gave it to you, and it's in my name. You were, the, you were of course, the agent that I used for yes. it. But just because I used you, don't, don't, don't think you're bigger than you are. You know, that's a really good thought, Taylor, because what he's really saying is they're excited, and he's saying, of course, of course the demons submit to my name. Yeah. I was there when Satan fell, and I'm giving you this authority. And I love that he uses snakes and scorpions. If you read Revelation, you will see images Mm -hmm. of snakes and scorpions both that show up to plague God's people. The demons are pictured as snakes and scorpions. So... I don't think he's talking about literal snakes and scorpions. I think he's actually saying, mm-hmm. I think he's actually using that as pictures of the demo- demonic forces. But he's saying, don't rejoice in the fact that you get to, that right. they submit to you. Yeah. Yeah. Rejoice that, that you have me. Yeah. Well, that you're like, with me. That I've written my, your names in the book of life. Right. And in, in, in a real real world interpretation real world uh like application i maybe is a better way of saying that is imagine like we've all done this we've all brought people to church and then we've been able to see these people's faith grow and maybe they become christians maybe they convert you know you get to see that and a lot of the time you will in your own heart say they're a christian because of me (laughs) i have friends i have friends my own wife i don't know how much i can say about this but my own wife we have friends that like they knew her when she was an atheist, and they give me credit. They are giving me credit. Ah, good thing you met him. You would never be a Christian without him. It's like, don't stop, stop taking credit away from God. I, 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 I'm nothing. I did not bring her to faith. I did not put faith in her heart. Like that was all. That's all God. And it does, it does kind of bother Hannah and myself that we that we get those comments once in a while. That's really good. Um, I think, I think that's a good kind of closing point on this passage, Taylor, which is that the point Jesus wants his disciples to get is, yeah, God's going to do great things through you, but that's not what you're ha- you're not You're not rejoicing that God's done awesome things in you. 
You're rejoicing that you have a place in his kingdom. And, and by his grace, you get to bring other people into that. Rejoice in that. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be happy with that. And, and I think that gives us comfort too today as Christians that if we look around us and we go, well, I see demonic forces. I see things happen. I see cult, cultists and yeah. false gods. And yet, I don't always see miracles. I don't always get to cast that out. I don't always get to call the demon by name and make him flee. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Because I have a place in heaven. Mm -hmm. So that's better. So I can just trust that. Perfect. Well said. I love it. Well said. Last thoughts, guys? Our names are written in heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us online. We loved your comments. We really appreciate your participation in this. If this was helpful to you, if you thought this conversation really helped you in some way at any point, please like, share, comment on it. Make sure that people get a chance to see it. The algorithm needs all the help it can get. And if you would please go to our Pub Theology Facebook page and review the page, like the page, share the page, invite your friends to the page, all of those things help more people see this. So if you liked this conversation... Make sure other people see it. You can do that. As I said before, if you want to join us live in the pub, we'd love to have you here. First and third Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. at Copper State in the loft. Please feel free to join us. Otherwise, you can always join us online. We're glad that you're here. Until the next time we see you, thanks for joining us, and keep thinking deeply, my theologian friends. <laughs>